If there was any year that I felt I was moving in the right direction, it was 2019. That summer, I was living in an apartment with a couple of my friends and was living my first summer away from home. I had a great internship with the PBS-affiliated radio station WEXT in Troy, New York. I was also working with a music clinic called Day Rock, where we traveled all over New York hosting shows and clinics for children's summer camps. I was having the best year in regard to booking performances, traveling the most I ever had for musical gigs, and actually earning legitimate money. I was still riding out the success of my win on PBS's Celebration of Music talent competition, Troy Division, back in late 2019. By the fall of 2019, I flew out to California for the shooting of their television series, where I met so many incredible musicians and shared a once in a lifetime experience. Besides California, I was traveling the most I ever had in my life, visiting nearby states for work and pleasure, states like Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, along with flying down to Florida, all within like a, a couple month period. I had an important job as the director of social activities at my college, working in the student association. I was also working at Troy Savings Bank Music Hall and continued volunteering with the audio crew at Masry Center of the Performing Arts. The fall in 2019 was the start of my senior year of college. That's when I completed my senior capstone project in December, which was to record and produce an album. This album was particularly special to me because it encapsulated my first three years of college. I was having good times going out and having little excursions with my friends. I felt like I was really kind of settling into that post-21 lifestyle. I was dating this incredible girl, absolutely beautiful inside and out, who was way too good for me. And boy, was I in love. By the time 2019 came to an end, I felt on top of the world. I was seeing major progress in my education, in my career, and in my life as a whole. I felt happy. I felt like I had myself together, well, you know, for the most part. And I had big plans for 2020. I wanted to spend my last semester hanging out with my friends and enjoying that last hurrah. My girlfriend and I were also planning all these little trips we wanted to take together and enjoy. We both talked about how much we wanted to explore, even if that was just like the little wonders nearby that we had yet to discover. I was starting to plan a summer East Coast tour and to release my album in accordance with it once I graduated. After that, I was looking to get a new apartment in Albany and hoping to continue to get more hours at Troy Music Hall, along with looking for other opportunities. The idea was to continue to ride the wave. But that's the problem if you just simply ride the wave. You're not necessarily reflecting on what's happening around you, nor preparing for the uncertainties. And then, 2020 hit. In the midst of all the World War III threats, multitude of celebrity deaths, a shaky socio-political climate, I began to witness things start to unravel in my personal life. There were issues in regard to my student aid that went as far as threatening my chances of even returning for my last semester. Actually, it looked like I wasn't even going to graduate, or at least not when I anticipated I would. It took through February to sort things out, and after much grinding against the system, countless hours of anxiety and Feeling a lot of confusion, we finally made it work out. Fortunately, my grandmother swooped in and helped the situation, but before all that, it was really tough. I wasn't telling anybody about this issue because I wasn't sure what was going to happen yet, and I didn't want to say one thing or another, but it was difficult going at things kind of alone and not sure where things were going to go. This was my last semester. I felt like at this point I was doing everything I was supposed to. I was doing everything right. I was keeping my grades up. I kept my scholarships. Everything seemed great. And then this was happening. I just remember this one day in particular where I thought I was leaving the next day. And my girlfriend and I were just in my room holding each other crying. It was, it was definitely a rough experience. I didn't know where I was going. To many people, that can be such a hard experience like it was for me, not knowing where you're going. Once that got settled, though, things with work got crazier. I kept being met with roadblock after roadblock with planning events, specifically for our big music festival at the end of the year, Rose Rock. I was spending much more time in the office than with friends or my girlfriend. I was late to classes. I was getting behind on schoolwork during the semester that I thought was going to all be a breeze. And then the moment that defined the rest of the year, March 11th, 2020 the day my college announced that we had to move out and that we would be handling the semester remotely due to COVID-19. 
Looking back, it was the moment that my wave was finally crashing into the shore. And boy, was it crashing hard. So why am I telling you all this? Because I am not the only one going through all this. My experiences are unique to me, sure. However, my emotions and my humanity are shared across the earth. My story is personal to me, but there are millions of people out there in similar situations. Many people were building themselves up to something that got pulled out from under them. Whether they were working towards their education, busting their hump for a job, improving their mental or physical health, 2020 made many situations magnitudes harder. There are many things I noticed about myself and those around me during this time period, and I want to highlight those things that I've noticed. So I hope in sharing my stories and struggles, I can help bring solace to people looking for an outlet of some kind for themselves. Whether that outlet be one of inspiration, motivation, education, and understanding. And besides sharing my perspective, I also want to be having guests from all walks of life to offer their perspective in order to engage in a narrative towards greater unity. But before I get into more of what 2020 has been like, let me take you back to the very beginning of Walsh Wednesday. We'll have more of that after this short break. 2020 has affected many industries, especially those in entertainment. This means that many technicians, engineers, editors, designers, makeup artists, directors, producers, writers, actors, singers, musicians, and many more will be struggling to find consistent work compared to what they had before. More than likely, during this time period, you turn towards some kind of entertainment to help pass the time and stay sane. You probably binged a number of shows on Netflix, caught up on your favorite YouTubers, and mellowed out with new playlists on Spotify. In times of distress, people turn towards the arts. Right now, the arts need you just as much as you need them. The arts may not be able to solve the physical issues in your life, but they help the mind and the soul. Many artists have turned to new platforms to support themselves, one of them being Patreon. Patreon is a site that allows fans and artists to connect on a more intimate basis and allows for donations to help supplement the art and services. Patreon allows creators to build a more sustainable income source while fans get access to the community, exclusive content, and pride of fueling work they love. I have my own Patreon page, and if you wish to support Walsh Wednesday, my music, and my other creative endeavors, I would appreciate subscribing to my page. The lowest tier of patronage starts at $3 a month, and that gives you access to exclusive content such as full Walsh Wednesday interviews, along with behind-the-scenes looks at my music, personal stories, Q&As, and more. If there's anything else that you think I should include, please let me know. You can check out more on patreon.com slash Connor Walsh. So Walsh Wednesday, where did it all begin? Well, if you followed Walsh Wednesday on YouTube, you're probably aware of the story. However, I want to refresh everyone along with introducing the story to new fans. In order to move forward, I want you to know a little bit about the past to understand my present. Walsh Wednesday goes back to my sophomore year of high school. I'm from Poughkeepsie, New York, and I went to High Park Central Schools, which was a town just north. I attended St. Peter's Catholic School from kindergarten through 8th grade and then transitioned to a public school by the time I got to high school, where I attended F.D. Roosevelt High School. By the time I left middle school, I knew I needed a change of pace, but it was odd going from a small private school to a bigger public school. I only knew maybe a total of five people going into FDR, and it was a process to establish myself. They say we are all one choice away from a different life, and I was about to learn that one December afternoon how true that can be. It was a Monday, actually. I had a chemistry project on the elements. My project specifically focused on Krypton. My teacher said we could get extra credit for doing something creative along with the typical presentation format, like writing a poem, doing a short skit, or singing a song. I chose to rewrite the lyrics to the Three Doors Down song, Kryptonite, and make it fit for the presentation. Fortunately, it went well, and I got the extra credit that I wanted, so that worked. <laughs> Right after chemistry was lunch, so I just brought my guitar down with me to the cafeteria. My friends were all messing around saying, Connor, you should play something. Yeah, sure, I can play something right here. I'll, you know, I'll play it quietly not to disturb anyone. No, no, go out to the center and play for everyone. I laughed. I was like, no, no one would want that. But they kept prodding, but I wasn't going to do it. A little bit later, a few other people from another table spot me with the guitar. One of them yells out, Connor's got his guitar. Play something. And they start chanting, Connor, Connor, 
Connor. Soon, the whole cafeteria is chanting my name. So I shrugged and jumped up on my table and started playing. I have no idea what came over me, but I started playing my heart out as I ran around, danced on tables, and got into people's faces and just, you know, had a whole time with it. When I was done, I remember saying, the guitar will be back on Wednesday. I don't know why I needed the guitar on Wednesday. I can't remember that, but I just know that I had to bring it in. The experience was so insane, it was like nothing you would ever think of doing, especially in high school. My mom remembers me coming home that day and recalls how much I was beaming. She said she had hardly ever seen me so excited. Well, that night, social media exploded with pictures, videos, and comments about the day. Posts are going up on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, you know it. People are putting comments like, Who said High School Musical can't be real? Or, Damn, that kid has balls. Or, Looking forward to the encore on Wednesday. The common thing going around on most of those posts was the hashtag Walsh Wednesday. Has a nice ring to it, right? I came back in on Wednesday with a new set of songs and played again for everyone at lunch, and again, it got a great response. From that day on, I decided to make Walsh Wednesday a recurring thing. I didn't want to overdo it, so I limited it to, you know, about once a month. I did it from sophomore year all the way to the end of my senior year. I think the people who enjoyed Walsh Wednesday the most were the security guards. <laughs> Many of them told me over the years that they loved it when I did it because it would normally control the regular shenanigans and rowdiness. They would say it would even calm people down or at least get them all to focus on just one thing instead of being all over the place. People from all grades and lunch periods would ask me when my next appearance would be and if I could do it in their lunch period. Some people even asked for requests. It felt really cool to get the attention and the appreciation for it, but I know that not everybody was my biggest fan. Some people would pretend to be into it, but just be mocking me behind my back. That or some people felt it was disturbing their time and that it was annoying. Others went as far as to say they thought I was pretentious, arrogant, and full of myself, and using Walsh Wednesday to seek attention. Frankly, for a while, I wasn't sure why I was doing Walsh Wednesday, but I knew hearing some of the detractors hurt me a lot. Few people thought I was fake, while at the time, my overly optimistic attitude and friendliness was genuine. I'll admit, I was a lot to handle and could be pretty intense back then. Honestly, I'm still pretty intense in a number of ways now, but I promise I mellowed out since back then at least. As I was saying, I didn't know exactly why I was doing it, but I knew the negative responses got to me because I knew that's not who I was. One day, a few months after the first Walsh Wednesday, I was doing a set of songs, and when I finished, this girl came up to me crying. She looked up at me and said, thank you, and ran away. I was very confused by the situation but a mutual friend broke it down for me. He told me that this girl was having the worst day, fighting at home, issues with her boyfriend, just failed a test in a class that she had been desperately trying to pass. Anything that could have been going wrong went wrong that day for this girl. And then she saw me perform. I wish I could remember the songs that I played that day, but apparently something resonated with her to make her feel better. There was something about me playing a few songs that gave her a pick-me-up. It gave her the energy and motivation to keep moving forward. It reinvigorated her. And that wasn't the last time I heard stories like that. People would come up to me and tell me after seeing me or hearing about me perform, they told me that it inspired them to go out for guitar lessons or singing lessons, or it inspired them to audition for the school play. Even non-artistic things, people told me that it inspired them to work out, join a sport, confront a friend or family member about a problem, ask someone out, or simply just gave them the energy to get through the rest of their classes for the day. I even had someone tell me it gave them the courage to come out to their parents. And by the way, it all turned out okay for them and their family. It was a very loving and understanding situation, and I'm glad that it worked out well for them. That was what Walsh Wednesday was doing. From either seeing me perform or hearing about me perform, I was giving people courage to do things they wanted to do. All the things they were hesitant to do before, they started doing because they saw me doing something I loved. Everyone has their something, their dream, their passion, that thing that makes them them. And often when we see someone doing their something, it makes us want to do our something. People would tell me that I looked so at ease performing. Tell you the truth, I was terrified. Every single time. I remember having so much anxiety prior to each Walsh Wednesday and sweating profusely. 
I would tell myself before each time I would go out there, this motto that I came up with that I have held on to ever since. This is the line, and I hope it can help you as well. I'd rather regret doing something than regret doing nothing at all. I would tell myself that in order to encourage myself to do something I wanted to do, but felt scared about doing. And that's what I told anyone who asked for my advice. Being brave isn't about not having fear, but rather looking your fear in the face and telling it, I'm going to do it anyway. It's about converting that fearful energy into positive energy. When we get anxious, we're releasing adrenaline. It's all about channeling that adrenaline and expelling it in a positive manner. I believe by the end of high school, I swayed even some of the harshest critics. One thing you got to remember is that when someone tries to tear you down, it's often because you're able to do something that they're not able to do. I'm not saying everybody wants to perform on cafeteria tables, but I was displaying a courage that they hadn't quite found in themselves yet. And after further exposure and actually sitting down and talking with me, more and more people found great respect for what I was doing. Walsh Wednesday sparked many conversations with people of all different social groups. I never limited myself to like one click by any means, and it gave me the chance to have really fulfilling time in high school. I tried having fun with each Walsh Wednesday, even holding a couple holiday specials, including myself and friends in holiday costumes. One year I dressed up like Santa Claus, while the next year I dressed up like Sam the Snowman from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I had a large inflatable costume from when I was the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters for Halloween, and then I converted it into the snowman costume. That year, I also had a couple of friends dress up like Rudolph and Santa and perform with me. The most special Walsh Wednesday for me had to have been my last one. I worked as part of the school audio crew, so I had access to all the sound equipment. So that Walsh Wednesday, I rigged up both cafeterias with speakers, and I hooked myself up and my guitar with wireless microphones. I skipped all my classes for the day, and I played for every study hall and lunch period throughout the day. It was a very touching and exciting experience for me to see how two and a half years of these performances came all together. During one period, I was playing Don't Stop Believing, and I catch my principal, Mr. Party, over by one of the doors with a stern look on his face and his arms crossed. Now, I had informed a few security guards and one assistant principal that I was doing this, but I never informed Mr. Party. Oops. <laughs> And this had to have been only like fourth period. I'm thinking to myself, ah, this is going to be shut down. This is going to be over. I'm going to go back to class. I finished playing that song. And while the crowd cheers, Mr. Party walks up to me. I stood stiff where I was, ready to be sent back to class or go to detention or something. Once he got right in front of me, the stern look melted off his face and it was replaced with a large smile as he held out his hand and said, way to be great. That whole last Walsh Wednesday was so surreal, everybody wishing each other all the best. Some people even cried knowing that this would be the last time like any of this would happen. One of the main things that people would write in my yearbook through the years, especially senior year, was that they would always remember Walsh Wednesday and how they appreciated that I always gave a little bit of myself to everyone. It was an incredible time in my life. And if I only knew how much this silly high school series of performances would continue to shape my life. More of that after the short break. Walsh Wednesday has been a passion project of mine through the years, as you can tell, and it cannot be done without your support. If you have a business, offer some kind of service, or just want to help pitch in, you can sponsor an episode or a multitude of episodes of Walsh Wednesday. When you sponsor, you'll be given about a minute or two to have your product, service, or whatever you have to offer highlighted. You can send in your own ad, or I can write and record something for you, with your discretion, of course. If you wish to discuss sponsorship opportunities for Walsh Wednesday, please email connorwalshmusic.management at gmail.com and put sponsor in the subject. Thank you all very much for your support. And if I can use my platform to help shine some light on some businesses, well, that would be time well spent. It's 2016. And I just started attending the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York. As much as college can be exciting with all the freedom and opportunities, it can be scary and overwhelming. I know the transition from high school to college for me was very mixed. I was getting very involved on campus with various clubs and activities. I had three part-time jobs, and I studied very hard. Though everything was moving forward relatively well, being so new, I was so consumed with a lot of insecurity and anxiety. Besides that, with all that I had on my plate... I was feeling burnt out pretty easily. I just remember sitting on a CDTA bus one day thinking, God, 
I wish I had someone motivating me and saying kind words. I need some kind of pick-me-up right now. And that got me thinking. I knew I couldn't be the only person feeling this way. By no means. Many of us are not vocal enough when we need help, while in reality, we are screaming inside for someone to listen to us, say everything is okay, to hold us. I thought back to Walsh Wednesday and how that used to revitalize others, along with revitalizing myself. I considered the idea of performing in the dining hall like I used to in high school, eh, but I opted out of that, thinking eh, it's a much different atmosphere and may not go over as well. One day on Facebook, I saw a post made by friends Kayla and Sarah Franskin. We attended FDR together and then coincidentally also went to College of St. Rose. They started a small web series called Saturday Smiles. It was the cutest, most wholesome thing you could have ever come across. They talked about their week, offered advice and counsel, and just had a really fun time. It was so genuine and pure, and I loved the concept. And that got me thinking, what if I turned Walsh Wednesday into a web series? I could record myself on my phone and upload videos to YouTube and Facebook. I could offer stories of inspiration along with perform some music. I remember recording that first episode in my dorm, all dressed up with a dress vest and a nice tie and performing Michael Buble's I Believe in You. It was a stupidly simple episode, but after uploading it, it got an overwhelming response from friends and family. People back from FDR were loving seeing Walsh Wednesday in a new format, while new friends from college were intrigued and appreciated what I was offering. It didn't take long for the concept of the episodes to expand. Soon, I was conducting interviews and highlighting some awesome events, charities, and music. Some of those early episodes focused on St. Rose's Relay for Life and a pie-to-the-face challenge raising money and awareness for Lupus Awareness Month. By sophomore year, I bumped up the ante even more with what I called the Walsh Wednesday Concert Series. Instead of me playing all the music, I wanted to showcase my colleagues. I reserved one of the rehearsal halls and would set up cameras and mics to record performances and conduct interviews with a number of my friends. As much as I love performing, I also found I love showcasing other people's talents and stories. The new narrative I was offering was received very well by my college community, and soon I was being recognized for my program. I continued sharing episodes of inspirational messages, music, interviews, and more, all from the beginning of late freshman year through junior year on a pretty consistent basis. And doing Walsh Wednesday led me to a number of fantastic opportunities at school and around the area. People enjoyed how I would host the program so much. I was asked to MC a multitude of events on campus such as open mics, battle of the bands, contests, concerts, comedy shows, game nights, dodgeball tournaments, and even the largest event of the year, Rose Rock, where I got the chance to interview pretty much every artist that performed from sophomore year and junior year. One of my favorite Walsh Wednesday interviews that I did was also with uh, radio personality and morning mayor of the Hudson Valley, Joe Daly. Uh, he was always such an incredible friend and great support to me over the years. We actually met at a toy drive when I was very little. I used one of my birthday parties as a way for kids to donate toys, and then we took all the toys over to the Toys for Tots drive that Q92, the radio station, was a part of. So that was my first time ever meeting Joe Daly. And then through the years, our paths crossed a lot. And he was a big support to me, my music, and my endeavors, just as he has been to this entire community. And I just got to say, Joe Daly's support has meant so, so much throughout the years. So the fact that I was able to interview him for an episode was really surreal. By the time I got to senior year, I stalled on production of Walsh Wednesday so I could focus on my senior capstone project, which was the album. That became my central focus as I also started my position as director of social activities. So that fall semester was probably the longest extended period of a time that I didn't work on Walsh Wednesday. It didn't really phase me at all since I was still being creative in other ways, but people would ask when it would be coming back. I would always explain that once I got through the semester, I would get right back to it. So the semester wrapped up, and as I said at the beginning of this episode, 2019 ended on a pretty great note. But come March 11th, everything would change. Finding out that we had to leave campus because of a virus that many of us knew very little about, it was confusing and terrifying. Whenever I found myself in moments of hardship, I would normally throw myself into work, and that's what I did. I was commissioned by the school to do a web series to make up for the fact that we could not have Rose Rock and other activities. Our advisor for the Student Association, Shreva McClellan, suggested I host a show that showed off St. Rose talent. Essentially, a branch off of the Walsh Wednesday concert series, but under the St. Rose umbrella. 
So immediately I went to work on doing Zoom interviews with many of my colleagues and showcasing their music through that. Along with doing that, I was inspired by all the live stream concerts I saw many professionals doing. So while I was using St. Rose Rocks as my platform to display other artists, I got Walsh Wednesday going again as a weekly live stream concert series. I would prep about 10 songs a week and perform live on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram for friends and family. I would look at the atmosphere and overall feel of the week and would shape the theme around it. Some weeks I would spend time remarking on socio-political climate, while other weeks I would just try to lighten the air with things like a Jimmy Buffett-themed episode. That one had to be probably one of my favorite episodes. And then, after about four months of doing the weekly concerts, I wrapped it all up by doing a live concert on my front lawn for my friends and neighbors to attend. I had a few dozen people show up on my street and front lawn, all socially distant, of course, and we had a great time. That would probably be one of my fondest memories performing. That all sounds great, right? Like, that sounds like someone who's really making the most of the quarantine and living it up. Well, if that's all you knew, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes. And it's for those reasons that really bring me here talking with you today. After the break, I'll go into the things that shook me to my core and what has certainly affected my 2020 experience. As I mentioned earlier in the program, I had the opportunity to record and produce an album as my senior capstone project. Well, I'm finally making the album accessible to the public. On November 27th, Black Friday of this year, I'll be releasing my second full-length album and first studio album, Away From Home. This album is very personal to me, as I share my experiences and feelings from my first three years of college. In this album, I highlight the experience of love and loss, moments of inspiration and desperation, and the overarching story of maturing during my experience at school. I've held on to most of these songs for about three years now, and it feels good to give them all to you. You can pre-save the album now, and it will be available to stream on all main platforms November 27th. That means you can check it out on Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Google Play, YouTube, Bandcamp, and more. I hope you consider checking out the album, and again, please consider becoming a patron at Patreon, because I'll be uploading exclusive content real soon in regard to the album for my patrons to enjoy. So as I was saying before, despite the things looking decent on the surface, I was struggling big time underneath. Come on, we all were. The COVID-19 pandemic is so unprecedented and is a major turning point in our history. First of all, the online classes were tough, mainly because I had a hard time focusing with the online learning. I'm a much more hands-on type of person, and that definitely extends to physically being in a classroom. And despite popular belief by many of my friends, I am not a morning person. I will sleep my entire day away if I could. But if I had a place to be, I can get myself up and going, but normally it would be a long, grueling process. When it came to Zoom classes, though, I would just barely get up in time, throw a hat on, and log on. I fell asleep in so many of my classes. Not intentionally, it just happened. I've always been someone to take my schooling very serious, but I lack so much drive and energy to get through. Even on my best days, I didn't think I was really grasping any of the subjects. While all that was going on, my family and I took this shutdown to tackle projects around the house. Well, mainly me. My parents were still busy with work, thank God. But that left me alone a lot. With their busy lives, there were things around the house that were left unattended. So during the pandemic, I took it upon myself to fix or clean a number of the things around the house. And layer all that on top of doing St. Rose Rocks, I was burning out easily. And that was not good for any of my relationships. If I didn't have to, I didn't interact with anyone. This became problematic for my girlfriend and I. Someone I desperately wanted to be in contact with, I hardly had energy for. I was so bad with my sleep schedule, and then with all my other responsibilities, I was finding it hard to spend time with her for video calls or movie dates or anything. I was also so in shock with just the whole state of the world. I really didn't allow myself to express myself very much. I didn't fully let myself react to everything going on, but also I didn't really know how to. Essentially, I was acting like Adam Sandler in the movie Click whenever he fast-forwarded through life, very numb and detached from everything. Obviously, these are not good attributes to be bringing to a relationship. After several weeks, our communication deteriorated and the stresses of the pandemic were weighing down on both of us. It got to the point we couldn't offer each other what we both needed 
as hard as it was to admit. So we broke up. All of a sudden, we were together and in love, and next, we weren't. I let her go. I thought I was making the right choice at the time, letting her be free of me and my problems, but that wasn't what either of us really wanted. We spoke afterwards saying that we were each other's person to go to when things got hard, and all we wanted to was to find that solace in each other. But I didn't know how to do that anymore. I was so emotionally checked out and confused. I loved her, and I cared for her so much. But I didn't know how to be a boyfriend anymore. Frankly, I didn't know how to be me anymore. And remember when I said I was just riding that wave? When you ride the wave, you often neglect to pay attention to certain concerns. In my case, I wasn't realizing and coming to terms with a number of my insecurities and fears. Insecurities and fears, which, looking back on, I realized prevented me from being the boyfriend I should have been. There were things that I didn't even realize that I was doing that negatively impacted our relationship, and it stemmed from unchecked insecurities. Unfortunately, I realized I needed to work on those things a little too late. Though we ended amicably, it was still extremely difficult for me, and I know I'm not the only one. Many of my friends and relationships were having issues. Distance in relationships can put a spotlight on and accentuate underlying issues within relationships, and it becomes a test of how well you can address them. Unfortunately, for a number of my friends, they met similar fates to myself. As time went on, I think I became even more emotionally detached. I had a hard time expressing myself to anyone, even if I tried. I used to consider myself a prolific person, and I could figure out what to say pretty well. My roommate, Victor, used to call me the silver-tongued devil. But in this case, I was far from it. Then, by May, my grandmother goes into the hospital for kidney failure. Honestly, we thought we were going to lose her that weekend. Fortunately enough, she was able to hold on, but she had to start going to dialysis three times a week and needed much more attention. I started taking her to all of her dialysis appointments, waking up at 2.30 to get myself ready, drive 50 minutes to get to her apartment, get her up and going, and get her to the appointment by 5 a.m., which then lasted till 8.30 a.m. Those trips to dialysis quickly increased to me being over at the apartment four to five days a week, essentially becoming my grandparents' caregiver. I was handling their transportation to appointments, taking care of their laundry, caring for their meals, cleaning the apartment, and anything else they needed. All this while still working on the renovations at home and just wrapping up the school year. As my grandmother got better and better, my grandfather was having a hard, harder and harder time. He had a couple of falls and multiple runs to the emergency room. There were nights where he couldn't get off the toilet and his neighbors had to come in and help. Things were getting far outside what I could handle, so I started looking into assisted living facilities for them. By the time July rolled around, I felt absolutely and totally spent. And just when I thought I had nothing in me, disaster strikes. First, I'm notified that my friend and colleague Kyle Robinson was killed in a car accident. Later that week, I found out my childhood school was closing down. And to top it all off, just a week after Kyle's passing, I get the call saying that one of my best friends, former college roommate, and someone I consider a brother, Marvin Chavez passed away due to complications from contracting COVID-19. I was absolutely broken. I remember attending Marvin's funeral and seeing him in the casket. Every emotion built up during this pandemic rose to the surface. I lost it. I had a total breakdown when I went up to his casket and knelt there. I couldn't believe my brother was gone. I couldn't believe all this. I couldn't believe all that this year has taken away. I couldn't believe this was the reality we were living. I had to be escorted away from the casket because of how much of a mess I was. After that day, I was simply on autopilot. I was just getting by, just doing whatever I needed to do, nothing more. Another thing I want to share that I'm not that proud of by any means was how much I started drinking during this time period. Going back to May, I started picking up the bottle a lot more, and it only progressed. I was never much of a drinker in the past, but I knew I had a high tolerance. I found myself drinking while working on house projects, and many nights I would spend drinking away while watching a movie downstairs. 
even a lot of the videos and content I was working on during that time period, I was all editing it while I was most likely buzzed. And then with all the death, I sank deeper and deeper into it. I knew it wasn't good for me, but I didn't want to admit what I was doing. It just made me feel better. Looking back on it, I definitely recognized that it was becoming a problem. Fortunately, I was given an opportunity to step away from a number of my bad habits. By mid-August, I finally was able to get a lease signed for an assisted living facility for my grandparents. We had two weeks before we could move in. So, knowing I had a lot of work ahead of me, I moved in with my grandparents so I could get them packed up and transitioned over easily. Where they were, I didn't get much service, so I could get off my phone, which I spent way too much time aimlessly scrolling on. I was also eating a lot of junk food. I knew living with them, I would be able to get my diet back online. And finally, no drinking whatsoever. For the next couple weeks, I would wake up to work out at the school track right around the corner from the apartment, and then afterwards, I would work on packing and organizing everything. The whole experience was very physically and emotionally exhausting, but I was proud and happy to do it. My grandparents had done so much for me over the years, supporting my endeavors in education and helping me be my best. They've always been a place of so much love for me, and I was happy to give my love back this way. I had no qualms of doing this for them. During this time I was living in Cornwall, my grandfather was brought into the hospital and then rehab for back issues from his last fall, and then he picked up pneumonia. My grandfather missed out on moving from the old apartment into the new apartment. Unfortunately, he never got to see it because on the day that he was discharged from rehab, he passed away in the ambulance ride over. He was 99. The whole thing was a dumbfounding experience. After I posted online that he had passed, I received many condolences from friends. One friend even said to me, I feel like you haven't caught a break this year. And that wasn't the first time I heard that. When people would say that to me, I never really knew how to respond. Until that night. I wrote this. It's interesting you say that. You're not the first to say that. Possibly not the last. And I'll admit that I've had a rough year. I know we all have. It's just how 2020's been. We've all suffered so much loss, grieving, internal and external troubles and life-changing circumstances. I'll admit, I had my moments of breakdown and identity crisis, yet regardless of it all, I've seen so much love, care, empathy, understanding, warmth, and genuine effort from so many people, whether it's directed at me or not. So maybe you're right, I haven't caught a break, but so has many others. And from it all, I've been given ample opportunity to learn more about myself prove my strength, and witness firsthand the potential for love around me. There have been plenty of times I wanted to be mad at the world, yet somehow I keep coming back to love in more shapes than I could have ever imagined. And that brings me here today. I know many people could say it feels like there's a lack of love in the world with the political climate, the fight for social justice, and much more. I have to say, despite all of that, I've seen some pretty incredible things. I've seen friends and family come together to celebrate beautiful lives of those they loved. I've seen people who are hanging by strings themselves offer a hand to someone they know is struggling. I've witnessed an outcry for social justice as many of my friends have taken to the streets to protest what is right and what is fair. I've seen many people take this virus seriously and people work hard to be considerate towards others. I've seen first responders firsthand and the care that they offer day in and day out. I've seen the tiredness in their eyes. I've seen artists and musicians create incredible art and share it in an effort to help those around them. I've seen people who took this pause to truly reflect upon themselves and work hard to better some aspect of their lives. Just like every early iteration of Walsh Wednesday, I plan to offer a platform of love, encouragement, and self-discovery. I hope to offer segments that motivate you in your daily lives while also giving you a moment to unwind and find a connection with someone. During this pandemic, I got to a point where I felt very lost and outside myself. It was a bit of an identity crisis of sorts, and I've been looking for positive outlets in order to learn, grow, and rebuild. As I'm finding my way back, I wanna highlight and dedicate episodes to topics that are important to me, such as loss and grieving, various aspects of the healthcare system, charity organizations, and an overarching quest towards mindfulness. Essentially, 
I'm doing this so I don't have to pay for therapy. But it wouldn't be Walsh Wednesday without the musical component. I look to showcase all sorts of talent from the music industry along with other arts and new media. I'm going to offer conversations with professionals in the fields, how they are dealing with the world, and of course, be an outlet for great talent. I plan on being very honest with y'all, and I have a lot I wanted to share. On that note, thank you very much for tuning in to this first episode of Walsh Wednesday, the Reflective Series. I hope you keep tuning in for more and tell your friends to tune in. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Also, you can find more content on my website, connorwalsh.music.blog, and become a patron at patreon.com slash connorwalsh. Thank you very much, everyone. As always, I'm glad we get to spend some time.